hello. Check, check. Check, check. Well, hello, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Well, I know I'm live, so I'm just going to go ahead and start here. Uh, let me restart my timer here, and there we go. Okay, so my name is David Dubchuk, and I am a creativity and innovation consultant and coach. I'm also a, a, a very long time middle school teacher, and that's kind of where I that's kind of where I learned this and got into this industry. And I'm I'm really excited to to bring a lot of this to you. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to pull up my questions panel, and if you have any questions while I am speaking, go ahead and uh, shoot them in, and I'll see what I can do to to answer them. So. As I said, my name is David Dubchuk. I'm a creativity and innovation consultant, and I'm going to start off today with a couple of stories for you. First story is of a man named Bill Bowerman. And Bill Bowerman was a former CEO of Nike. And in the 1970s, he had a problem. You see, colleges were installing synthetic track surfaces, and the metal cleats that they were using on their track shoes couldn't grip the surfaces. They were banned because they would damage them. And so he had this problem, and he was, he was thinking about this problem for a long time. And uh, one morning, his wife was making waffles for breakfast. And he looked at the pattern in the waffle iron, and a, a moment of inspiration hit him. And he ran into the garage, and he mixed up a urethane mixture, poured it directly into the waffle iron. And in 1974, the Nike waffle trainer that you see here on the screen was born. My next story is of a gentleman named Percy Spencer. Percy Spencer was a radar technician who was working on a radar antenna one day and he was eating a chocolate bar. And he put the chocolate bar down on his desk, turned on his radar antenna, and the chocolate bar melted. And he goes, hmm. After thinking for a while, if this could be possibly useful in any way, the microwave oven was born. And then finally, uh, many of us in elementary school, we heard the story of Alexander Fleming, who discovered penicillin when he realized that bread mold killed bacteria in his Petri dish. So, what do these stories have to do with my talk? Well, you see, all the time, people have great ideas. In business, we are looking for great ideas. We ask people to give us ideas, new ideas, new products, new systems, new ways of moving things forward. And every idea that is presented has problems. But it's those problems where the possibilities for innovation lie. In fact, in 2003 or 2004, at a uh, pitch meeting where they were trying to pitch new Apple products at Apple, somebody said, you know, we should make a cell phone. And Steve Jobs, Steve Jobs berated this person and said, that is the worst effing idea ever. Why would we ever do that? 
I'm going to tell you more about that story in just a little bit. But here's what I teach as a creativity and innovation consultant. See, there's two different things. We have both mindset and systems. Now, mindset works like this. Mindset is somebody who believes about themselves that I'm a, I'm a right-brained individual, which, which doesn't exist, by the way, okay? That's not a thing. Right-brained, left-brained, like everybody has a whole brain. It's, scientifically, there's not a right-brained, left-brained. There are different systems within our brain that use various parts of our entire brain, but there's not a right-brained, left-brained system. Uh, I can get really nitty-gritty into the science of creativity if we need to, but that's not the purpose of this presentation. Um, but anyway, look up central executive system and default mode network. That's what that's all about. Uh, mindset. So someone believes I'm right-brained or I'm creative or good ideas just come to me. My family when I was a kid called me curly-brained. Okay, that's, that, was, that was our family's term for creative. That's a mindset thing. In business, we like systems. We like processes. We like people to have jobs, roles, procedures. We like our forms. We like our documentation. Okay, that, that's what we like in business. Now, what I do is I teach mindset systems. Things that we can practice. Things that we can improve on over time. Things that we can document. Uh, systems that we can implement, practice, and do whenever we want to. We can call upon them to work whenever we need to. You see, these stories of Bill Bowerman, Percy Spencer, and Alexander Fleming, they were accidents. Okay? These were pure accidents. If Bill Bowerman's wife didn't decide to make waffle that, waffles that morning, the Nike waffle trainer doesn't exist. Right? If Percy Spencer didn't like his Hershey's bars, the microwave doesn't exist. These were accidents. But what if, what if we could take these systems and turn them, look at the, or what if we could take these accidents and look at the mental processes behind them so that we could turn them into intentional systems we could use whenever we want to. See, we all want a workforce that can innovate. But is that what we're getting? Or are we getting a workforce that we hope has happy accidents? You see, a system, I teach systems because systems are things you can count on. Systems can be relied upon. Systems can be practiced. Systems can be activated on demand. The accidents, accidents rely on you having a good day. They only happen if you have an innate ability. They depend on triggers. They depend on Alexander Fleming happening to notice that the bread mold killed the bacteria in his petri dish. But systems we can use whenever. Now, here's where this becomes important. You see, out in the business world, 77% of CEOs say that they can't find the creativity and innovation skills that they need. While at the same time, 60% of CEOs will say that creativity is the most important resource they have to keeping their businesses competitive. Creativity is the most important resource they have, but 77% of them cannot find the creative people that they need. Well, here's where my background comes into that. See, I've spent the last 11 years as a middle school computer science teacher, besides doing my creativity consulting here. Uh, and I, I got my master's degree in education after kind of struggling with some of these creative things really early on in my career. Really struggling with the fact that we need our students to be creative, but I just, early in my career, I just could not get them to be. Now, early in my career, I made, I made an observation. I was watching my students going through the hallways in between class. And I came up with the term that I like to call the factory farm model of education. Okay, Here's, this is why CEOs are struggling to find the creative people in their workforce. It is because for 13 years in school, our kids are never allowed to make their own autonomous decisions at any point in the school day. 
Every moment, every minute of the school day is planned for them. You're going to go to this class at this time and eat lunch at this time and do this activity right now and turn in this assignment by this date. Every moment of every day is scripted for these kids and then they go into our workforce and they encounter problems that they have never seen before and when we ask them what we should do, we get everybody's favorite answer, I don't know. How do we fix this? The answer is mindset. There's a story about elephants. Elephants that are raised in captivity. Elephants that are raised in chains. These elephants will go on to be rescued and set free. Okay, They're... they're um, Liberators will come, they'll take the chains off of them, they'll tell the elephants, you're free. And you know what happens to these elephants that were raised in chains? They continue to act as though they have been chained. They continue to act as though they are in chains currently because they don't know any other way of acting. It's not enough to just take our workforce and set them free if they've never known what freedom is like before. Mindset. Mindset is how we set them free. Mindset is something you can practice. Mindset is repeatable. We can practice this with repeatable, proven systems. Mindset plus systems. And here's what happens when you have the mindset and you have the systems. Couple of stories that I really enjoy. Uh, this one's one of my favorites. My mom is the director of an outdoor museum in Wisconsin. It's called Norskedalen. They're a Norwegian heritage museum. Uh, some of the earliest European settlers in western Wisconsin were the Norwegians, and this, this museum's mission is to, is to preserve the history of the Norwegian settlers in the area. And so the hills across western Wisconsin are dotted with these old, old Norwegian buildings. And what Norske Dalen tries to do is, you know, when they find out that a building is about to be torn down or about to, you know, fall down because it's 170 years old, they try to go in and rescue it. Bring it back to Norske Dalen property, preserve it, restore it, uh, to preserve the history for all of time. And so you can kind of see one of their, uh, their homesteads here. Now, in the 1980s, when they were just starting out, they had a problem because they wanted to bring one of their buildings up to Norskedalen, and their plan was to put it on the back of a flatbed truck and truck it through town. But the, the city of Coon Valley, which is where they are, city of Coon Valley wouldn't give them the permits to bring this building through town. And so they had a problem. Now, some people see problems as a reason to stop. Some people see problems as a reason not to do something. Some people see problems as a stopping place. And the North Island people could have said, well, I guess that's it then. We'll just be a nature center. We're, we won't bring buildings. We'll just be a nature center. Right? They could have just said that. Because for some people, problems are a reason to stop. But not for the North Island people. Because of their mindset, <clears throat> because of their mindset, they looked for the possibilities. And so you know what they did? All right, so the city of Coon Valley, uh, it's a Norwegian city, so they have a Norwegian celebration every summer called Sent Namai. And at the Sent Namai parade, they realized that the, the Sent Namai parade route was the same route they needed to bring their building down. So they entered their building as a float in the parade. I don't know, how about that? Right? That's creative thinking right there. But they didn't let the problems stop them. They had this great idea of preserving the buildings. They couldn't get the buildings through town. That was a problem, but they saw possibilities. And they said, well, let's enter it as a parade float. And now, you know, I can only, I can only imagine, like, uh, you know, the sheriff showing up on their property later that evening. You know, like, gee, how, how, did, how did this building get here? Right? But it started this tremendous museum in the area that's a, that's a huge tourist attraction now. So they saw possibilities. Every good idea has problems. Every good idea. There is no idea in the history of any ideas ever that are born perfect. Every idea has problems.
problems. And the iPhone, when it was first presented, had problems. Okay, the iPhone, this is cell phones in 2003. iPhone, uh, cell phones were cheap. They were clunky. They dropped calls. They were non, they were not intuitive. And the carriers dictated the specs. And when somebody told Steve Jobs, we should make an iPhone, he saw this and said, I don't want Apple having anything to do with this. Apple doesn't make cheap, clunky things. Apple, Apple products work. And you know what? Nobody dictates specifications to us. We dictate the specifications. That's what Steve Jobs said. But you know what? His engineers saw the possibilities. You see, you can see problems as a reason not to do something, or you can see problems as something that can be solved. And all of these problems could be solved. Cheap? Doesn't have to be. It can be gorgeous. It can be beautiful. It can be high quality. Clunky? Doesn't have to be. It can be amazing. Dropped calls? Well, tell you what. They drop calls because the carriers dictate the specs. If we dictate the specs to the carriers, we won't drop calls anymore. Intuitive? Guys, we're Apple. We can make it intuitive, right? They saw all of these problems as things that can be solved. Problems can be reasons not to do something, or problems can be something that can be solved. Every good idea comes with problems. But when you practice, when you practice the right mindset, those problems are no longer obstacles. Problems are no longer stopping points. Problems are no longer reasons not to do something. Problems are things you can solve. So, what mindset exactly are we practicing? And this is what this is part of what I would teach you if you were a coaching client of mine. We work on we work on three things specifically. Um, this is this is more an environmental structural thing within your business or classroom or school or environment. Uh, environmental practices that promote creativity. Beyond this, there are actual like thinking systems. When you're encountering a problem, what can we do? There's there's actual thinking systems, and I'll get to that in a second. But this is more environmental. So psychological safety is the ability to freely be able to express any idea without fear of reprimand or ridicule. Okay, that's the ability to say, I want to make an iPhone without fear of having somebody yell at you for it. Okay, that's psychological safety. Curiosity. You see, curious people notice things. They tend to make connections. Curious people tend to wonder why, right? And those questions lead to innovations. Curiosity, fortunately, is something we can practice and we can improve over time. As well as divergent thinking. The word diverge literally means to go out, is what divergent thinking is. Divergent thinking at its most basic level is coming up with lots of ideas very quickly. Okay, If you have a problem, I can give you 5 or 10 or 15 or 20 different ideas for it. That's divergent thinking. Not all of those ideas are going to be good, but that's not the point. Divergent thinking, lots of ideas, means to go out. Divergent thinking plus psychological safety means this. You create ideas, and then you judge ideas. You don't do them at the same time. Yes, it's important to talk about whether an idea is a good idea or not. But when you're doing divergent thinking, first you just come up with lots of ideas without any care as to whether or not they are good or not. Your, your goal in divergent thinking is quantity. Lots and lots and lots of ideas. Reserving judgment. Later, we'll talk about the problems. Later, we'll talk about whether or not they're good. Right now, we just want lots of ideas. A pioneering creativity psychologist in the 1950s, 40s. His name was Alex Osborne. His big quote was, quantity breeds quality. If you want one good idea, you have to go through 300 so-so ideas to get there. So, here's an example of divergent thinking and, and kind of putting that into practice. I'm, as I try to teach my 7th my and 8th graders divergent thinking, I, uh, w we have a warm-up activity every day. And in this warm-up activity, I give them an off-the-wall question, something like this. You are 
on a field trip, four hours away from home, your bus breaks down, how do you get home? And I ask him to come up with as many ideas as possible. Well, what happens is some people put steal a car. Always the bad kids. It's always the bad kids who write steal a car, but always the bad kids, right? And I ask. Okay, we go around the room. I ask what people's ideas are. And then I say, how many of you wrote steal a car? Bad kids will raise their hand. And then I say, how many of you thought of steal a car, but were too afraid to write it down? And a few more hands would go up. You see, that was a failure to reserve judgment. Okay, they self-judged their idea. They said that their idea wasn't good enough and they didn't write it down. But here is why it is important to write down stupid things like steal a car. Because if someone writes down steal a car, that might make somebody else think of the police, which might make somebody else say, ah, call the police for help. Now that's an, an actionable idea. It might lead somebody else to say, well, hey, if we can steal a car, what, let's steal another bus. Which might lead someone else to say, or, you know, we could borrow another bus. That's a good idea. Might lead somebody else to say, hey, find another bus that's broken down for a different reason and swap parts. Right? And now you've got three actually good ideas, all because somebody wasn't afraid to say, steal a car. That's the type of divergent thinking, coming up with lots of ideas, letting, new tr letting ideas trigger other ideas, and reserving judgment. Don't worry about whether it's a good idea or not yet. So, the next thing I'll do, if I'm working with you on how do we, how do we structure our conversations so that we can solve, solve these tricky problems? Well, really what we do is we go through cycles of diverging and converging. And that's really all it is, right? First, we diverge, come up with lots of ideas, and then we converge. Converging means, of those ideas, what, what ones are most worth pursuing further? However, so if we have 300 ideas and we're trying to narrow it down to five ideas that are the most worth pursuing further, all of those ideas will have problems. So then that becomes the next phase. What are all of the problems with those ideas? And then, here's where the magic happens. The next phase, the next converging, how do we solve each of those problems? See those problems as possibilities. See those problems as things that can be solved. That's why it becomes important to practice this mindset. When it comes to curiosity, that's the second part. I call this the creativity formula. Okay, so I just talked about psychological safety and divergent thinking a little bit. Let's go to curiosity. When it comes to curiosity, you see, creative thinking depends on asking questions. And asking questions is what leads us to genius investigations and genius ideas. You see, curious people make connections. Asking questions is what leads to genius investigations and genius ideas. Curious people ask, how can we? When there are problems, curious people ask, how can we solve them? But curious people don't just ask, how can we do things better? Curious people ask, how can we do better things? And it's those better things that add value to your business. It's those better things that lead to innovation. One final story before I wrap up my time slot today. The inventor of the Polaroid camera had a very young daughter, okay? And uh, he was an old school photographer. Uh, this is back when they had to take film slides into dark rooms and all of that. Uh, so he went into, or he went on a, a day long photography expedition with his, with his very young daughter. I think she must have been four, four to seven, something like that. I forget the details sometimes. Um, but they went on a photography expedition together, and the next day, they finished their expedition, and he says, okay, we have to wait until tomorrow to see these pictures. And you know what his, da you know what his daughter asked? His daughter asked the very important question that led to the innovation of the Polaroid camera. 
He said, we have to wait until tomorrow to develop these photos. And his daughter said, why? Curious people ask, why? That's what leads to innovation. That's what leads to genius thinking. And it's a simple question. But that is what we need to train our workforce to be thinking all the time. And I tell you what, when you get that mindset right, it's going to absolutely change the way you see everything. You're going to want to share it with everyone you know. In fact, you're going to start getting frustrated with people who don't think like this. My final question for you. What is the value of the ideas you haven't had yet? 46% of people, according to study by Adobe, 46% of people will pay more for a superior good or service. But maybe that's not what you want. Maybe you want your workforce to be more energized. Maybe you want your workforce to just take more initiative, to be biased toward action. Maybe you want to improve productivity so you don't have to lay people off. Or maybe you just, you just want to get home on time more consistently. The way to find that idea is practicing the mindset and the systems. Whatever the word value means to you, it's out there. You just haven't had the idea yet. Go get it. My name is David Dubchak. I go by the name Creative Dave because Polish is hard. CreativeDave.net, that's where you can find me and my resources. And uh, I just redid my website, so my books are for sale, but I haven't moved the, the storefront over to the new website yet. So uh, keep checking CreativeDave.net, that's where you would find my books. And if you want to contact me again, you can contact me through creativedave.net. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who joined me today, it's been a pleasure to speak to you today, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here. Hope to talk to many of you again in the future. creativedave.net, come visit me. Let's talk.